your unique story our global audience global one media Global One Media is pleased to present exclusive one-on-one -on -one discussions with public company executives, an opportunity to make informed investment decisions. I'm your host, Ashley Berry, and we're welcoming Pluralock Security CEO, Ian L. Patterson. The company offers real-time cybersecurity solutions that use artificial intelligence to identify, prevent, and eliminate insider threats, ultimately securing the enterprise and ensuring compliance with requirements in financial healthcare and federal organizations. Pluralock is listed on the TSXV as PLUR and the OTCQB as PLCKF. Thanks for being here, Ian. Actually, it's great to be here. Thank you. Well, Pluralock is renowned for implementing a strategy known as zero trust architecture. And for those who may not be familiar with that specific term, perhaps we could explain this and discuss how this strategy offers enhanced protection to companies and organizations. Actually, for, for those business owners and uh, professionals who have been active in, in the industry for a number of years, you're probably familiar with, with this idea of a firewall. You have a firewall, it sits at the perimeter, and it, it tries to keep out the bad guys. Well, what the industry has come to, to realize over the last couple of years is that that perimeter, that firewall, hasn't actually stopped most data breaches that we've seen in the news. Instead, we need what's called a defense in depth strategy. And this is where absolutely you have your network security, your perimeters, but then you also look internal to the organization or to the enterprise and you deploy appropriate controls. And so even if somehow the bad guys get around or circumvent the firewall, even if somehow the bad guys uh, manage to get a phishing email sent, that there are additional security controls where you don't trust anything in the inside the enterprise, hence the name zero trust architecture. So this is really the way of the future. Uh, it requires a, a paradigm shift in terms of thinking around strategy, uh, but it's absolutely an area that we are uniquely positioned to help enable as a result of our AI continuous monitoring uh, products and capabilities. Yeah, I mean, I have to imagine that it can be a really scary space, especially for organizations. So having a company like this that can really truly dig deep inside and, and come up with these amazing protections and using AI, which really is fascinating. And as you said, the way of the future, maybe you can talk a little bit about the AI specifically and how it works. So there's really two components here. I think AI uh, has certainly been in the news a lot recently. Pluralock sits at a very interesting intersection uh, because we are both a cybersecurity company and we are at our heart uh, an AI company. And so we get to see both angles. I think that it, there's two sides of AI. I think the first side, uh, and certainly the way that we have implemented it, we use artificial intelligence to identify who the person is on the device in real time and continuously, not just first thing in the morning when you sit down to log in, but actually continuously throughout the day, uh, we're able to, to provide that check and validation that you are, in fact, the right person. I'll give you a practical example. I was on the phone with a, a large financial institution last night, uh, one of our customers, and he was relaying stories about how our system was able to detect uh, when somebody else uh, jumped on um, in a home setting. So in, in this case, it was a worker, he was at home, uh, and one of their kids was was on their computer. Uh, and so our system successfully detected, successfully alerted the enterprise, they were able to investigate, and they found that, thankfully, uh, it was a fairly benign situation. Mm -hmm. But the system actually provided that visibility and telemetry. Certainly in a work-from-home setting, that, that is otherwise quite difficult to get. You don't know who is on the other end of that computer unless you have uh, systems or controls to be able to validate. Our technology, uh, fundamentally at its core, uh, is using behavioral biometrics. This is a form of biometrics very similar to a thumbprint or a, a facial recognition scan. But the key here, Ashley, is that we interact over time. Again, it's not just a static point in time check, because after that check, who knows what happens after you've logged in. We're really, we're operating on, on a continuous basis every five to 10 seconds. Uh, we have six patents in this area, a, a world-class uh, data science and artificial intelligence team. Um, and this this underlying technology has actually had over 40,000 hours of, of pure research that has gone into it. So it's a very robust background from where we come from. Um, and this is the this is the solution that is is quite unique in the market today. 
Yeah, I really appreciate that specific example about about the real time, about knowing exactly who it was at that time. Um, you don't often hear about that. Um, as far as economic feasibility and efficiency, perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on the cost effectiveness of this approach and the swiftness of setting up uh, the security systems for your clients and the potential need for team training and how all that works. Well, I think that AI provides uh, a level of efficiency and productivity boost across the enterprise. I think we're seeing that uh, play out uh, in examples uh, all the time. But I think the other element here and what we have to be wary of is that AI is, a, is an equal opportunity tool. So the bad guys are able to use it just as well as the good guys are. Um, certainly, we're, we're concerned about the rise of AI threats. Uh, we're concerned about uh, bad guys being able to send a, a very convincing email. Um, but with the use of AI, not only can they send one very convincing email, they could send 100,000 very convinc convincing emails mm -hmm. with, with largely the same cost. It doesn't cost them that much more. So, so we're concerned uh, about the productivity boost that, that this new technology will enable bad guys. Uh, I think on the on the good guys side, internal to the enterprise, absolutely, there's applications of AI like ours. Um, I, I suspect that we're going to see other applications of AI uh, to for security teams. I think the one thing that I would caution, though, is that this productivity boost um, is still very new. Uh, and so for enterprises that are um, are looking at using large language models like ChatGPT or BARD, um, that uh, uh, you know that there's um, that we have to be wary about the data that we feed into those models. So I think that it's a time uh, in the industry that's going through a, uh, a lot of change uh, right now. I think uh, in the conversations that I have with security leaders, CIOs, CISOs, uh, and other C-suite executives, um, there's a lot of attention and focus um, because we are at this pivot point this inflection point where this new technology is being adopted uh, throughout the enterprise. Mm. So, so let's briefly touch on the transition from legacy security systems to zero trust architecture, which is what we talked about earlier. Um, I would imagine that presents some challenges. Uh, maybe you could describe the steps involved in that process. I would say opportunities, Ashley. I think that any time that there's, there's uh, a change, I think it's an opportunity to upgrade, to update, uh, to refresh and ultimately to provide more value to the enterprise. Um, but certainly we're working with, with organizations uh, at all levels of security sophistication. I think we're seeing some in some industries uh, overall, those particularly who are highly regulated, like our, our customers in financial services, um, you know, they're, they're pretty well uh, uh, mature. Um, they've already deployed a lot of these uh, controls in place to protect data and to protect systems. I think as, as we go to industries that are a little bit less regulated, what we're finding overall as a trend um, is that they haven't uh, necessarily deployed version one or version two of network security or endpoint security. Um, and so in, in some respects, you can actually leapfrog, uh, you know, just go straight to the most advanced solutions. And so that that presents an opportunity. I think, though, that that, um, uh, you know, cybersecurity overall as a market is estimated to be well over uh, a trillion dollars. And, and I think that the the um, requirement for businesses is really to have a focused approach to try and identify what their specific needs are. Um, so crucially within a zero trust architecture, uh, it's about asking the question to the, the security team to say, where are areas of trust today? Where do we just assume that that this is okay, or where do we assume that the user is going to do the right thing? Or where do we assume that this email is coming from a trusted source? And then anytime that there are those assumptions, how can we place a either awareness, uh, some governance or a control to validate that that's actually the case? Now, if we're able to do that effectively, it, hopefully we can actually make it easier for the end users to go about their business. So ultimately security, we're trying to reduce risk, but mm -hmm. uh, we have to do so in a way that uh, still allows the business to function. Uh, yes. You know, the, the, joke, the joke that I make here is that a, a perfectly secure computer is one that is encased in concrete at the bottom of an ocean. Very secure, <laughs> completely yeah. useless, right? And so so we have to balance the security need uh, against the risk that we're trying to mitigate. And so that's why things like uh, our Pluralock AI solution 
where we are providing that protection invisibly, continuously, and in real time in the background, it actually enables both. We're, we're enabling the business to reduce risk. We're providing some additional insight and telemetry, but we're also just allowing the user to go about their day. We're not going to annoy them with constant prompts to say, log in, check your password, uh, you know, check your phone for a, for a text message, et cetera. I would have to imagine it's a very delicate balance. Um, what are your clients saying? Our clients are, are I think, concerned about, uh, about the new threats um, that are coming out. We've seen over the last couple of years uh, a massive spike in ransomware. I think even individual consumers are going to be familiar with Colonial Pipeline, where as a result of a ransomware attack, we actually saw people unable to get basic necessities like gasoline. Um, and so we also saw that with uh, some of our other critical infrastructure, including food, uh, JBS Meats was hit with a large ransomware attack. In Canada, we've had a number of um, uh, attacks and, and data breaches on, on the East Coast, particularly with regards to healthcare um, that we're seeing. So I think customers um, are, are people too. And as people, we are just seeing a massive impact of what happens when cyber attacks occur. Um, there's there's actually a, a, a running tally of organizations and businesses that have gone completely out of business as a result of suffering an existential uh, data breach or cyber attack. And so I think that that's not something that we saw five years ago. It's certainly not something that we saw 10 to 15 years ago. You know, in the 90s, uh, we were really we were we were talking about viruses and passwords. And now we're talking about existential risk. Um, recently, the Bank of Canada actually came out with a, a uh, report analyzing the uh, risks to the financial system. And actually, above and beyond any other risk on that list, above nation-state conflict, um, was the threat of cyber to the financial apparatus. So this is this is a new risk. Um, it's in the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, when they issue public reports, they will actually equate cyber risk as just as dangerous as the risk of nuclear uh, or other threats. So this is the degree of severity. And I think now we're actually having the conversation inside businesses, particularly at the board level and the C-suite level, to realize this risk and then actually do something about it. Uh, now, the good news is that there is a, a wealth of uh, experience now. Um, this is this is no longer simply the uh, uh, you know the domain of of some ex uh, military folks uh, who who have some uh, specific training. There's now a, a whole industry around being able to realize and and minimize these risks, um, and that's ultimately what we're doing here at Plurlock. Terrific. And as we said, you know, this is the way of the future for those that are, you know, interested in investing for your current shareholders and customers. Any final thoughts, Ian? I would absolutely encourage uh, investors to check out plurlock.com slash investors. We've got a very robust uh, investor relations section there. And actually, I would recommend specifically to sign up for the, the investor updates. Uh, I think that that's definitely an area. If you're considering putting cybersecurity in your portfolio, would absolutely welcome a, welcome a sign up there. And as you said, it's not going away ever. <laughs> so Pluralock Security CEO Ian L. Patterson, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your really important story and impressive insights. We look forward to sharing additional updates.